Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at All the Big Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Sean Tabay from Washington, D.C., United States. Dr. Tabay is a board certified orthopedic surgeon at the Children's National Hospital and an assistant professor at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. After obtaining his medical degree from the Chicago Medical School, Dr. Tabay trained in orthopedic surgery and clinical research at the St. Louis University Hospital. He subsequently completed an advanced fellowship in pediatric orthopedics at the Northern California Chernobyl Hospital for Children and the UC Davis Medical Center and a second fellowship at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, where he gained further experience in treatment of children with complex limb deformities and cerebral palsy. Dr. Bay has presented his research nationally, published scientific articles and co-authored book chapters. He's a member of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, the Limb Reconstruction Society, and the American Orthopedic Association Emerging Leaders Program. If you've noticed, Dr. Bay has lectured on a channel in the past and has already reached a huge audience. And today it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Sean Tabay for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Sean. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for having me back. Um, always a pleasure talking to you and your, your, um, your following. So topic today I wanted to go over is a topic that's near and dear to my heart as someone who takes care of children with cerebral palsy and that's cerebral palsy and its manifestations in the hip, which I feel as an orthopedic surgeon or orthopedic surgery community, um, we should all be have some familiarity with it. All right, so I have some disclosures, but nothing related to this. So an overview, um, you know, we're gonna discuss cerebral palsy, discuss what it is truly, um, the etiology, the pathophysiology, both neurologic and musculoskeletal, and dive into the classifications a little bit. Um, in regards to the hip and cerebral palsy, we'll also look at the pathoanatomy and the natural history um, of what happens, uh, the evaluation that we need to take part in as orthopedic surgeons, and also the management. So cerebral palsy itself has a very broad, um, kind of recognition. I think most of us, or not necessarily us, but most people in public or other practitioners in medicine um, just categorize children with cerebral palsy and they don't really have a true understanding of what it is. Um, but hopefully when we discuss this talk, we can have a better understanding of that. So, you know, when we talk about cerebral palsy, there's recently, at least in the American, um, kind of um, Hollywood scene, there's been more representations of um, people and children with cerebral palsy. And um, that's kind of helped with um, teaching us what it is. As you guys know, cerebral palsy can be very wide range, you know, very high functioning individuals who have um, barely any musculoskeletal issues to um, individuals who are unfortunately um, cognitively and musculoskeletally devastated so there's a very wide range that we have to consider. Cerebral palsy itself was first described by um, William John Little in 1861. Um, he referred it to as cerebral paresis and um, others referred, it, referred to it as Little's disease. Um, Dr. Osler in 1887 um, further kind of distinguished cerebral palsy and even um, Sigmund Freud himself um, dived into the topic. Cerebral palsy or CP is truly not a diagnosis. It's just more of a um, categorization of what's going on. Um, in our healthcare system here in the States, um, often people use it, use it as a diagnosis when they don't, they, you know, they can't really find another reason why a child is um, delayed or why they have um, gross motor delays. So they categorize that and diagnose it as cerebral palsy. But in, in fact, um, that's incorrect and that shouldn't be done. But as a spectrum, cerebral palsy has some key characteristics. Obviously, there's a neurologic injury um, that has, has happened at one time. Um, we know that the neurologic injury is not progressive um, and it's a static injury. Um, it's permanent, however, um, and as I mentioned, it's non-progressive. But from an orthopedic surgery standpoint, 
we're really worried about the musculoskeletal sequelae and what happens in regards to the movement disorder. And um, as the body grows, well, when there's a constant change in the forces applied to the development of the muscles and the bones, then the musculoskeletal issues are progressive. Um, but again, the neurologic issue is not. So in 2006, there was a better definition and classification of cerebral palsy um, put out there. And that was um, stated as a group of permanent disorders of the development of movement and posture causing activity limitation that are attributed to non-progressive disturbances that occurred in a developing fetal or infant brain. So I think this is a good baseline definition to, um, to understand. So again, even based on this, still not a diagnosis. Some further background, um, CP has an incidence of two per 1,000 live births. So it is the most common physical disability affecting children in, in developed countries. And why um, it's becoming maybe not more prevalent in developed countries, but definitely one of the more prevalent, if not the most prevalent um, physical disability is because technology is so advanced and um, premature babies, even as early as um, early 20 weeks are able to be um, kept alive and, um, and they are able to survive due to the technology advancements of our neonatal ICUs. So that's why we're seeing more of that. Um, as a definition, again, it's a static encephalopathy and the musculoskeletal pathology is progressive. And going back to the basis of this talk and looking at the hips, all children with CP are at a risk of developing progressive hip displacement. So it's very important kind of sequelae to for us to be aware of. And one thing I always try to hammer and teach the residents and fellows is that um, you know, we were so used to DDH, developmental dysplasia of the hip, babies born with their hips out. But in this population, almost always the hips are, are normal at birth. And um, it's really over time that they, they develop the dysplasia and they um, come out needing our attention. So, you know, how does this happen? What is the etiology? Um, the best, you know, no one knows 100% for sure, but our, our, the research has shown that most likely this is due to um, some, some form of lack of oxygen um, to the brain, you know, uh, right before birth or during the time of birth, which causes a um, one-time brain injury. And because there's been so much focus on this, as you can imagine, it's a big, um, big reason for litigation or for um, issues um, with in the OB world. And as you can see here, per thousand live births, um, it was a little higher in the 70s and it went down. But again, it's moving up now in the most recent times. And even now, it's even the incidence is getting closer to back in the 70s. But it's not that we're not doing something right. It's just that, again, where our technology is so advanced, we're able to keep babies um, alive that are born um, very premature. So this is another kind of showing that as the rate of um, cesarean deliveries has increased over time, the prevalence of um, CP has not. So, you know, these are some deferring viewpoints of, you know, why is it truly due to a complicated birth um, or is it is there other components going on? So, you know, again, people have looked at these, this in, in much more detail, and that's why now we're kind of looking at different routes or reasons for why um, children are born with cerebral palsy. And we've, you know, Nelson and Elberg have shown that peripartum events do not necessarily predict CP. Um, and there's been some other case control studies um, that shown that 70% of children with CP had no, um, you know, no incident of a hypoxic event or even their brain MRIs don't show any signs of that. So I think this is a very big area of upcoming research um, that's, that our people are focused on, on to see if 
you know, what other components are related to children being born with CP. And I think most people now kind of agree that there's probably a multimodal component, um, not only an issue at birth, but most likely some kind of genetic um, predisposition for some of these children. So again, these are just some um, other possible reasons, you know, as when a baby's born um, more premature, their chances definitely increase. There's other, other factors, intrauterine growth restriction, um, maternal intrauterine infection or viral infection. Um, and then the last one, genetics, which I think that's the big, big area of research now. Um, and um, I know the NIH, National Institute of Health here, is doing a lot of work on it. One of my mentors in California, um, now that he's on his verge of retiring, has got a big grant looking at, that he's gonna focus on looking at genetics. So I think this is gonna be a big area and I'm looking forward to see what um, they're able to show us in the next 10 to 20 years. As far as the pathophysiology, um, again, the, there's, for myself, I, I still am a proponent of obtaining the MRI. Um, even if the MRI doesn't necessarily show it, I think the best way to diagnose and truly um, categorize someone as being under the CP spectrum is to get an MRI. Um, and the MRI shows the, the side of the primary brain injury. Oftentimes it's um, involving the white matter. And here you can just see representations of, the, um, of a brain um, with the evidence of uh, white matter and, um, and a brain pathology. So here, this is just looking at the, the spectrum or the cascade of issues that's, that results from periventricular um, leukomalacia or white matter loss that happens in these children at a young age. And you can see here, there's um, loss of inhibition or connections um, to, the low, to the LMN tract, and then they develop um, either positive or negative upper motor neuron tracts, which can lead to most likely spasticity, um, clonus, and also on the other spectrum can lead to a weakness, poor balance, and sensory deficits. But we often um, commonly see the, what you see on the left side with the spasticity and hyperreflexia. Looking into this pathophysiology more, um, again, it really depends on where the lesions are. Uh, and I think for the scope of this, we don't really need to get into this, but it's, it's important to understand um, where the lesions are occurring. Um, and I think if we do, with the help of our neurology colleagues, we can help kind of attack the, the, the sequelae in a better way to prevent the tone or the um, hyperreflexia or the spasticity um, in order to kind of um, remedy or prevent, you know, worsening of the orthopedic issues as they get older. So CP itself, there's different ways to classify it in general as far as the type um, it is. So there's spastic cerebral palsy, which is the most common that I'm sure most of us see and treat on a daily basis. Um, and those are the kids that have increased spasticity and hypertonia. Um, then there's, um, excuse me, there's dyskinetic CP and also ataxic CP. Spasticity, this is really the, the bane of our existence as orthopedic surgeons, because not only is the spasticity, um, the tone leading to the orthopedic issues, but it also affects um, the success of our orthopedic interventions. Um, so spasticity and tone control is really, you know, the ultimate key. And spasticity is a velocity dependent resistance to stretch. Um, in these children, it often re results in overactive dysregulated um, stretch reflex. So um, this increased spasticity and tone over time, based on our, you know, basic biomechanical principles leads to the abnormal um, bone, bony skeletal development. And here you can see some great studies looking at um, muscle biopsies of children with cerebral palsy and control and just showing the, 
the changes in the integrity of the, the muscle architecture um, from the control group and the, and the cerebral palsy group. And really, you can see that there's a change in the volume of the sarcomeres and also the length and the contractibility of them. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not only what's happening in the brain, but it also is leading to changes of the integrity of the muscles. And I think another key component with looking at muscle itself is with the prevalence of Botox or other chemo denervations, we're even further affecting the integrity of the muscles. So again, another graph depicting um, just the, the stiffness um, within a, um, a cross-section of muscle um, here for the specifically the hamstrings. So in cerebral palsy, things progress as um, kids get older. And initially, it can just be spasticity, but over time, the spasticity leads to a muscle issue, and then the muscle issue leads to a bony issue. So you can see based on this cartoon, um, you starting at stage one with spasticity or dynamic contracture of a muscle group here is focusing on the ankle, um, foot ankle unit. Over time, um, that dynamic spasticity leads to a fixed muscular tendinous contracture, such as in a heel cord contracture. And then again, that um, static muscle contracture will, you know, lead to skeletal issues or most likely prevention of the skeletal, um, the skeleton itself or the bony anatomy to normalize. As we know, you know, the, the tibial torsion doesn't um, change and, you know, normalize as the child gets older or the femoral antiversion um, doesn't change. So things that we anticipate and expect to normalize as kids get older um, does not, and that affects their overall, um, you know, um, function and stability. So we see P classification as far as classifying them in regards to their ambulatory status. Um, I think this is the most important classification scheme to use is the gross motor function classification score. It's really the only way that we can communicate about these patients as a multidisciplinary team. If, you know, when someone tells me a patient is GMFCS level two, I am able to get have a picture of that child in my head. Or if they tell me a, the patient's a level five, I also can get a um, picture of what's going on. And I can, you know, already have a, a kind of a hypothesis of a plan um, for them. Without using this, it's really hard to do. Uh, the only point of contention, primarily in our colleagues in physical medicine and rehab, um, even neurology is that uh, they feel you have to be a certain age to get this classification and then that's fine. But I think even at an earlier age, you know, earlier than five and six, when truly you can classify them, you can get an idea of where they're going to be. So I think it's very important to understand um, this classification score and also be able to extrapolate their ultimate level of function um, as they get older. So moving on to the, you know, the, the, the meat of this presentation. So the hip in cerebral palsy, again, this is not the most joint, you know, not the most common joint affected. The most common joint is the foot and ankle, but I think this is an area of the body that can re really affect their children's quality of life and function. And um, it's an area that we really need to be aware of what's going on and, um, hopefully be able to maximize the anatomy and the integrity to really benefit these children and their families as they get older. So as I said, it's the second most joint affected in CP. Um, you know, it, it all starts with the spasticity and then developing contractures and ultimately those abnormal forces leading to subluxation of the joint. So as we all know, we're born with, you know, increased femoral antiversion, um, and over time that normalizes. Well, children with this spasticity, which is often, you know, affecting their hip adductors, you know, the adductor lung is 
brevis gracilis, they have this constant hip um, adduction. Um, their femoral version doesn't change. Their um, femoral heads eventually, you know, become subluxed and then dislocated um, if left ignored. And if the hip is dislocated, not only will it develop degenerative changes to the hip, as you can see to this right hip in this picture, um, but you also develop acetabular dysplasia or abnormal development of the acetabulum because the socket doesn't know how to um, form correctly. So hip displacement refers to the gradual lateral displacement of the femoral head from under the acetabulum. So pretty basic. Um, one thing that's often confusing for residents is how to categorize or describe hip displacement in children with CP. We, we classically just want to use what we're used to with DDH, such as Shen's line, um, looking at the four quadrants, um, things of that nature. But for CP, the gold standard should be used is, is to use the migration percentage or Reimer's index as some still refer to it. But um, migration percentage is really the way to go. And what that's looking is you're looking at a fraction, which is um, A, the numerator, the portion of the femoral head or um, epiphysis that's not covered by the acetabulum, and then B, which is the denominator or the complete width of the femoral head. So kids with CP, they all have a slight increase um, to si significant increase in hip displacement. On average, it's 25 to 35%. But you can see here that it really is based on the gross motor function classification. So, you know, that's another big reason why it's important to utilize this classification when describing patients. If they're a one, they have almost a negligible risk of hip displacement, increased hip displacement. Whereas if they're a level five, their um, rate of hip displacement reaches, you know, 90%. So very important to, to understand how this progresses with the severity of the condition. So again, this is just another picture um, graph from the, the work of Kurt Graham um, and his team in Australia, just um, looking at the, the increased risk of hip displacement um, as the GMFCS classification score grows up. Um, again, and this is another depiction of how to describe GMFCS level um, from one through five. So again, this is just some screenshots from their article um, back in 2006. So for, for those who haven't um, seen this article or read it, I would highly recommend it. We can definitely um, provide it to you guys if needed, but it really gives a good understanding of how this rate and this incidence increases as these, children's, these children have a higher level of um, involvement based on their GMFCS classification score. So we briefly touched on this earlier, but you know, why does this happen in this population? Well, it all starts with spasticity and contractures of those hip abductors, hip flexors, medial hamstrings. Um, this muscle imbalance leads to osseous deformity, which is increased femoral antiversion and acetabular dysplasia. So it's cascade of events, all starting from the neurologic issues, the spasticity, um, and then working its way to the muscles and eventually the bones themselves. So this is just some focusing on the pathoanatomy. You, you, hear, you see here um, just some um, mechanical descriptions, cartoons, looking at the frontal, sagittal, and transverse planes um, and looking how and showing how the, the spasticity of the, specifically the adductors and iliopsoas can lead to um, this abnormal um, rotational profile and subsequent hip issues. This is this graph is a normal depiction of femoral neck anaversion um, from when a baby is born till when they're um, around skeletal maturity. And you can see the normal pattern is that femoral anaversion 
um, goes down over time. Um, but in children with cerebral palsy, this doesn't happen um, and definitely doesn't happen as their, their level of um, their GMFCS level increases and they continue to have an increased level of fem femoral neck aneversion. And on average, it's about 36 and a half degrees um, at nine years of age. Um, so really this is all one thing I try to, you know, to instill in the trainees is it's, it's, you know, when our body doesn't, you know, exhibit the normal weight bearing um, requirements it, it needs or that we normally do by just standing and walking, um, it, the body doesn't know how to, how to kind of adapt and change and develop normally. You know, there's a big push towards getting these children up and really max assist standards or gait trainers. And I think those, that's great. And I think it's, it's definitely good for children to, you know, increase their function and increase their, just their activity level. But unfortunately, those techniques aren't going to lead to changes in um, normalizing the, their bony development. It's truly the the normal weight bearing that um, the body needs in order to develop normally over time. So you can see here, um, we talked about the, previously about the femoral aneversion, but also, you know, as we get older and we weight bearing, our femoral neck shaft angle um, goes down and without absent weight bearing, that femoral neck shaft angle um, doesn't, doesn't um, go down and normalize over time. So this is a good graphical or cartoon depiction of looking from GMFCS1 to GMFCS5 and showing that the um, neck shaft angle, um, you know, how the, the, the difference between um, the level of disease um, and also the femoral aneversion, the difference. So the more involved they are, the more they're going to have um, continued femoral aneversion and an increased neck shaft angle. And that all subsequently results in an increased migration percentage and more of the hip being uncovered. So acetabular dysplasia, as we all know, means abnormal development of acetabulum. And acetabulum is a structure that forms and develops based on what's within it. If there's nothing there, and so it's not gonna develop normally. Um, and as children get older, by the age of two, their acetabular index should be uh, approximately 22 degrees. That's just a number I've kind of memorized. So 22 degrees by two years of age. Um, but if the hip isn't there and the hip is kind of migrating out, then over time that acetabular index can't, can't cannot um, decrease and normalize. But also, you know, even if the child's hip comes out as they get older, we know that the acetabulum, you know, can remodel and kind of develop up to the age of six. So even if it, the hip comes out at a later time, the acetabulum still has time to um, change and to uh, become dysplastic. So the natural history, this is a graph looking at the natural history of pain in relation to migration percentage. I think one of the, one of the hardest things to talk to families about, especially with children who have, um, or with patients or with parents who have um, children with cerebral palsy who are a GMFCS four or five who are not very functioning and primarily wheelchair bound, it's hard to talk to families about doing surgery to put their hips back in when um, you're not doing the surgery to, to help with pain. Often if the hip is out, even at an early age, they don't have much pain. But, you know, we can see that as the migration percentage goes up, that over time, the prevalence of hip pain does truly increase. And this, these x-rays show the natural history of, you know, not addressing a, um, a hip dislocation. It'll just um, the spasticity continues, the contractures continue, and eventually the hip will come out. Um, even before the hip comes out, 
Um, in the severe cases, you have this windswept um, depiction of the pelvis and which affects child's positioning, um, both when lying down and also in a chair, which ultimately affects her quality of life and um, affects the family's ability to, to perform basic hygiene um, issues. So, you know, as, as clinicians, we should always, you know, be, be cognizant of what we need to look for on a physical exam. Um, physical exam is a huge part of making these diagnoses and moving forward, but, you know, obviously x-rays and other modalities are needed too, but, you know, focusing on the physical exam, we really want to assess hip abduction, um, both with the knees flexed and extended to see what we're dealing with. As hips come, go out over time, um, that hip abduction can change, which can kind of direct us on what we can do or what needs to be done or um, what we should plan for in the future. Um, also looking at hip flexion contractures um, by performing the Thomas test uh, as, as depicted, um, and then looking at limb length issues in the asymmetry. So if one hip is coming out in asymmetric hip dislocation or subluxation, you'll often see some limb length issues and asymmetry that can point you towards the, um, the right diagnosis. And then, you know, ultimately quality of life is and functional um, and um, maximizing functional issues in these kids is most important, especially for myself. So in the higher level fours and fives, you really wanna um, examine their pelvic obliquity and um, their seating position in their chairs. Um, because if they're sitting in a way where, you know, it's uncomfortable or gonna lead to other um, medical issues, you know, pressure sores or um, worsening um, of their uh, spinal deformities, things like that, then you really wanna um, catch that and address it. After our exam, next key step is to get appropriate x-rays. So we'll get into this a little more about hip surveillance, but um, for children with CP, we don't need to do a frog leg um, lateral x-ray. It should, should just be primarily the AP um, image of the pelvis. And with that, you can determine your migration percentage. You can determine your acetabular index. The hardest part about getting an x-ray though is with the spasticity and the contractures, um, our x-ray technicians often have difficulty getting x-rays. So we really need to help them out to position the patient or teach them how to position the patient in a way that maximizes the, their images. So on this right side, you can kind of see um, some key things. So we always want to try to get the legs in neutral and with the patella um, facing upward. And we want to really prevent lordosis of the spine. So elevating the legs um, on some pillows or blankets is um, often really useful. So here, this is a AP pelvis, um, again, depicting um, the radiographic parameters that we want to look for. So on the right hip, we're showing um, the calculation for migration percentage. Again, the numerator A is the portion of the femoral epiphysis or head that's not covered by the acetabulum, and then B is the total width of the femoral head, um, and that is the uh, denominator. And then on the left side, you're looking at the acetabular index. As far as some just values to know, you know, less than 10 is definitely normal. Um, in children with CP, less than 30 is, you know, nothing that we need to address, but it's something that we should watch. I mean, over 30 is when we, you know, truly consider that um, worrisome and, you know, we have to watch very closely. And then obviously if it's in my hands and in most people over 50% is when you want to really address something um, surgically, which we'll get into, but a true dislocation is, you know, over 90 um, to hundred percent. So we're, you know, most of us are probably surgeons and we want, um, we enjoy surgery. We want to do what we can surgically, but in this 
group of patients in this issue of hip displacement with CP, the most important thing is hip um, is prevention and surveillance. So, you know, hips subluxation and dislocation is truly can truly be preventable. I'm not saying that it's we can prevent their need for surgery, but we can prevent their frank hip dislocations and we can prevent there's those hips becoming um, uh, developing degenerative changes and developing that significant acetabular dysplasia. And there are multiple studies and countries such as Australia, um, Norway, um, um, that have, not Norway, excuse me, um, Sweden, that have shown that hip surveillance does in fact work and can really um, prevent any incidence of true hip displacement or um, true hip dislocations or development of degenerative changes um, that need the salvage or palliative procedures that um, unfortunately we still often have to do. So what is hip surveillance? It's just process of monitoring and recognizing important signs of progressive hip dis displacement. So it's not only um, radiographic examinations, but also our clinical exams. So again, from um, Professor Graham and his group, um, they have a great article reviewing hip um, surveillance and prevention and developing a, a um, plan, scheduled plan for how, what to do for children um, once you have a GMFCS classification. So we won't go over this a lot of words, but this really is a cheat sheet of knowing what to do. And um, I recommend everyone having this in their clinic to kind of refer to. So you know, you're, what you're doing is you're really directing your images to identify early subluxation and prevent dislocation. Um, you're looking at the migration percentage. And as I said, you know, up to 30 degrees or 30 or a migration percentage of 30% um, is okay. When he goes over 30%, we really want to uh, watch it closely and true hip surveillance should be instituted in more of a primary care setting in a setting where these patients are seen uh, more frequently. And when he gets over 30%, that's an appropriate time to make a referral to an orthopedic specialist um, for long-term follow-up. And then, you know, once you notice the hip displacement is over 50%, um, you can really um, open the discussion about surgery and um, start the process to, you know, do the appropriate surgery needed to prevent a frank dislocation. And as I alluded to before, there's some countries, um, Sweden, Australia, and Norway, that um, after instituting hip surveillance, their rate of hip dislocations has gone down to almost, to, or in some places, zero. Um, and prior, um, it was close to 10%. Um, the only caveat in these countries, which is a little different that it is here in the United States, much smaller countries, um, much better communication within their providers. Um, so it's, it is, it is a little, it is, it can be a challenge in, in certain places of the world to truly institute this. So again, hip displacement in, in chill, young children is often asymptomatic, um, but the pain increases as the migration percentage gets worse and as the children, the child gets older and develops degenerative changes. Um, and then what we're really focused on is to preventing pain and preventing fixed deformities, which affects their quality of life. And um, the debate is still open about, you know, the unilateral hip dislocations lead to pelvic obliquity and subsequent scoliosis, or does the scoliosis lead to the pelvic obliquity and the um, hip displacement. So I think the jury's still out on that. So we have no real um, consensus. As far as management, like anything else, you know, there are non-op um, options, um, Botox or other chemo denervation uh, with phenol in, in the regions of the, the hip adductors um, to denervate those muscles to decrease the spasticity. Um, there's also, you know, oral medications, which a lot of our neurology and physical medicine rehab colleagues um, focus on that with tone, tone management. Um, bracing really, really has no utility 
in my practice, um, but sometimes I institute it just for soft with when we do with soft tissue, um, soft tissue surgeries. Um, but ultimately, these things really are not effective in preventing the progression. They, what's going to happen is going to happen. Um, but if we can delay the need of surgery um, until the child is a little older, um, not only is their anatomy more, uh, you know open to surgery, but also their chances of reoccurrence significantly go down. And then other things that, you know, you know, we can talk about our um, um, uh, baclofen pumps and, um, you know, rhizotomies, things like that, that can affect tone. So as far as operative management, um, I talked about soft tissue management. So again, soft tissue management alone often never is the, the solution. Um, but in my hands, um, I utilize it in really young children, you know, often below eight, the age of four who have a migration percentage, you know, around 50%, um, but don't have a frank dislocation and they have, you know, evident signs of contractures to their adductors. If I can do a soft tissue release um, in combination with chemo denervation and buy them one or two years before a need for skeletal surgery, then, um, you know, I, I, I like to do that because I feel the risk, the rate of reoccurrence um, then goes down as the child gets older. And these, um, these soft tissue releases really are primarily with um, the adductor longus, tenotomies of the adductor longus, but you can also um, address the gracilis, the brevis. Um, some go after the iliopsoas um, and the hamstrings. I don't myself, um, but I know some, some do. And then utilizing phenol for the obturator nerve um, is definitely an option. So as far as the, the abduction limitation where I feel this is useful is, you know, when there's less than 35 degrees of 35 to 40 degrees of hip abduction, um, I think this is a, a useful um, modality to utilize. And, you know, I would say this is all anecdotal, but, you know, there has been a handful of patients where um, they've had significant hip migration percentages and just with soft tissue alone, um, things have um, normalized or gone down below 30, but I think that's just, in a way, just the luck of the draw. So here, this is just a, a table representing, you know, patients based on GMFCS level and um, their need for different kinds of surgeries. And as you can see, as the GMFC level goes up, the need for osseous surgeries, bony surgeries definitely increases. Um, also, the utilization of, you know, salvage or palliative procedures also goes up. So again, really, it just this all ties into the fact that the GMFCS level is, you know, really important to understand um, if you're taking care of these these patients. And again, this is another kind of kind of Kaplan-Meier curve or graph this depiction showing that the success of surgery based on the GMFCS level and how, you know, the more involved they are, the, the decreased chance of success or need for further surgeries as they get older. So in regards to operative management reconstruction, that, you know, really the, the, the crux of what we do and what we want to do um, the varus derotational osteotomy is, you know, one of the most common procedures done in these children. Definitely the most common procedures that I do uh, in my practice, probably three to four patients a week. So it's very common. Um, it's a great procedure. It allows you to correct the femoral antiversion and coxa valga um, with these frank hip dislocations um, where there's difficulty to put the hip back in safely, then you can also shorten the proximal femur um, to decrease pressure on the femoral head to get it back in. Um, indications, 
you know, indications can be variable, but in my hands, really, migration percentage of 50% or more um, is when I uh, pull the trigger for doing something like this. So here is an x-ray just showing an example of a, a VDRO um, and acetabuloplasty done elsewhere. So moving on to the acetabuloplasty or with children with CP, um, I would say the, the most common one is the Dega osteotomy or there's variations um, such as the San Diego um, osteotomy, but these osteotomies are incomplete transiliac osteotomies that hinge um, through the triradiate cartilage. They're volume reducing procedures, which um, provide posterior and superior femoral head coverage. And, um, you know, there's some indications radiographically that people use for these, um, but I truly feel that in most cases, if you have a child with cerebral palsy and you're doing a VDRO, um, it's a great idea to do a DEGA, especially if they're over, you know, five to six years of age when we know that their acetamin is not going to remodel anymore. Oftentimes people are concerned because they don't feel um, doing a volume reducing acetabuloplasty is going to give them enough coverage, especially laterally. Um, but, you know, you got to stick to your guns um, and realize that it actually um, does a lot more than you anticipated to do. So um, this is just showing the kind of the exposure going down to the um, outer table of the ilium and then directing your osteotome um, down, you know, just in between the AIS and the ASIS down towards the triradiate cartilage. This is another interop image showing um, the volume reducing procedure hinging through the triradiate and then having that, that hinge kept open with a wedge of bone. Either can be either um, an autograph taken from the proximal femur or um, iliac crest, or um, I also um, often use iliac crest um, allograft. So another just um, Kaplan-Meier curve showing the their survivorship of a VDRO based on the GMFCS classification. And this just shows that it's really, again, as the level of GMFCS goes up, the um, Survivorship goes down slightly, but still very good rates of survivorship um, after a VDRO, um, especially if timed correctly, and, um, and definitely if it's augmented with a acetabuloplasty. Um, this is a table graph showing um, patient reported outcomes or patient's family reported outcomes um, using the CP child score. And, um, you know, initially there might be a dip in the, in the score because, you know, you're in the initial post-op period, um, family's getting used to the restrictions that you have to set forth and the child's pain. But over time, um, the scores, you know, definitely go up. And um, most importantly, they kind of are maintained as, you know, as a child, continues to grow and get older. Whereas we know that if we didn't do anything, these would probably go down over time. So often people ask, you know, well, what are the risks, especially for revision? Um, well, we know that at the higher GMFCS, we have a higher rate of revision. Um, the younger we do the surgery, um, the higher rate of revision. That's why I like to wait um, till a child is five, six years of age, but, you know, oftentimes we can't do that. Um, and then another big question is VDRO versus VDRO and DEGA. Um, so, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm more in the school of thought that just is better to do the DEGA as well. I'm really improving that, that acetabular coverage um, and not, 
completely or just relying on the body to remodel is probably the best route to take. And most likely the reason for a revision procedure is uh, when the acetabuloplasty is not done. And then, you know, in surgeons that have a high volume of patients with these conditions, you know, doing both of them at the same time, uh, they're pretty, you know, facile at it. And it really doesn't add much, if any, morbidity. Um, complications, there is femoral head AVN, uh, which has been reported as high as 11%, but um, that could be most likely minimized with doing a femoral shortening. Um, I would say the, the complication I see the most is HO, and I think that is just this, the soft tissue stripping off the, the lesser trochanter of the iliopsoas can lead um, to some you know, mild HO formation, but often it's often never symptomatic. So the last kind of category of operative management is salvage or palliative procedures. Um, this is what we want to prevent. This is the whole goal of hip surveillance. We don't want to see this anymore. Um, and fortunately, in some countries, they don't. Um, but we still do in here in the United States. Um, and, you know, the indications to do this is when you have, you know, a frank dislocation that's um, been there over time and you have significant joint degeneration and, you know, significant acetabular dysplasia. At this, at this point, you know, you can't put this hip back into place. You're, you're not going to make things better. You're only going to possibly make them even more painful. Um, so, you know, putting a square peg into a round hole is not going to, is not an option. And the most important thing when you, when you are dealing with this is to, you know, make it clear to the families what the expectations are, why you're doing this, and what the goals are. So, you know, your goals are pain relief. Your goals are to assist the family with um, them being able to do hygiene and care of their, their child and to really allow them to maximize the quality of life um, that they can have, um, especially with sitting. So different options. Um, there's, you know, femoral head resections. There, um, um, there's, you know, valgus osteotomies with, with or without femoral head resection, um, you know, McHale, modified McHale procedures. Um, I, I don't like to do this, this procedure that often in general, um, but if I have to, then, you know, I, um, I do. When I do do it, I prefer the valgus um, osteotomy of the proximal femur with um, femoral head, removing the femoral head, and then doing a, a soft tissue repair kind of around the, the iliopsoas, or sorry, around the lesser troch, um, incorporating um, some of the musculatures to kind of form a sling uh, to prevent proximal migration. Um, there has been some descriptions of um, total hip arthroplasties in children with cerebral palsy. Um, I, I have never been involved in this, but I think you know, in a certain situation, and very with a, um, in a situation where spasticity and can, and tone isn't a huge issue, and and um, you're not very worried with redislocations or um, morbidity from like infections and whatnot, then it might be an option. But again, um, I haven't done this in my hands. And then there's also other um, arthroplasty techniques like. Um, hemiarthroplasty, shoulder hemiarthroplasties that have been used um, in this population. So as far as pain relief, people have um, looked at this, looked at different options, and um, really, for the most part, these um, different options do result in significant um, pain relief um, to primarily the, the resection and the valgus osteotomies. So in conclusion, uh, cerebral palsy is a primary neurologic condition with progressive secondary musculoskeletal deformity. The GMFCS classification, <coughs> excuse me, is a powerful prognostic tool for a child's function and risk of hip pathology. Um, 
The neurologic issue isn't progressive, but the hip pathology is progressive and highly variable based on the children uh, in their, their classification of CP. The most important thing I would like to get across is that appropriate surveillance allows for earlier intervention to prevent hip dislocation and degeneration. Soft tissue releases um, are an option and they can um, possibly prevent, but really their main goal is should, should be to delay reconstructive surgery um, in the well-selected patient. And then as far as reconstruction, this is a truly effective way of achieving and maintaining a well-reduced hip and ultimately improving the quality of life of a patient. And lastly, um, salvage operations for the most part are equivalent in that they help with pain relief um, and allow for palli palliation. But um, ultimately, I'm hopeful that in my lifetime, the need for this will um, go down to being non-existent. So just a quick case presentation while we're here. Um, this is a two-year-old that was referred for hip evaluation, GMFCS equivalent five, too young for full diagnosis. On physical exam, you know, there was some limited hip abduction to 45 degrees, but um, otherwise um, nothing that was significantly stood out to us. And you can see here, this is a, the initial AP pelvis, uh, slightly frogged, but nonetheless, the, Hips are covered. The migration percentage is uh, definitely less than 30%. There's some evidence of acetabular dysplasia. Um, but at this point, based on the level of, um, you know, prognostic CP, we, we, you know, our goal was to do hip surveillance. And then um, they come back with concerns of subjective um, hip pain, um, the hip abduction is decreasing, has gone down about 5, 10 degrees bilaterally. Um, otherwise, nothing that stood out on exam. And then now you can see um, that the, on the left side, the hip is definitely um, migrating out. The, the hip migration percentage is, you know, 50, if not more, 50%, if not more. And the acetabular dysplasia is also appearing a little worse. And then, so still, at this stage, the patient was still very young. Family wasn't keen for surgery. Um, we recommended close hip surveillance every six months. Um, the repeat x-ray, again, shows a similar finding, possibly a little worsening of that hip subluxation. And then again, um, going a year later after that, you know, similar continuing maybe a little bit worse on the left side, but the acetabular dysplasia is also continuing to get a little worse. The, sh the socket looks a little more shallow, but still hasn't, still not dislocated. And then again, in, 20, in, in March of 20, um, 2020, um, we're seeing a similar thing, but, and on the right side, we're also seeing evidence of further subluxation. So at this point, the child is much older and we're starting to discuss you know, pulling the trigger on with um, surgery and hip reconstruction. So on the left side, you can see here, we discussed with them doing a VDRO on DEGA, and this is just going through the steps of our VDRO and how I do it. And then also the DEGA acetabuloplasty. So you can see here that we improved the cox of valga deformity. We also addressed her femoral anniversion interoperatively. I don't like to, to put them in too much varus. Um, so my goal is about 115 degrees of um, new neck shaft angle. And then you can see that the head is well covered. And similarly on the, the, the left side, or excuse me, the right side. Of note, even though I recommend a Dega almost all the time on this right side, I didn't, I decided to go without it um, because I felt the head was um, adequately covered. This is just a post-op image. All right. Thank you guys. I know a lot of information in a span of an hour, but I really appreciate the opportunity.
Thank you, Sean, for yet another brilliant talk from your side. A uh, couple of questions. Of course. One is obturated neurectomy. If you talk about obturated neurectomy around 20 years ago, it was a big thing. I mean, it was, it was in vogue operation. But off late, the incident, I mean, people have lessened the use of obturated neurectomy. And what do you think those are concerns about obturated yeah, neurectomy? Yeah. That's, it's interesting you bring that up because we were talking about that last week. So since I my training, I've never seen one. Um, and but from what my physical medicine and rehab colleagues and some of the more um, seasoned surgeons say, this they felt like there was a lot of subjective pain or neuromas developing um, that they couldn't really account for, like very what they describe as similar to like very severe nerve pains with any movement of the, of the hip, any abduction of the hips. And then when people would go back in, they would see significant scars and um, kind of changes locally that was concerning to them. Thank you, Sean, for that. And what has been your experience with uh, Botox and uh, at what uh, degree is it where when the rhymers index is something less than 30 10 to 30 that is where you try giving botox and what are the muscles that you inject right so so th this is this is changing <laughs> in like in the last year i'm really changing my viewpoints mainly because of the all the new literature that's coming out of australia but i would say on average when the when the Reimers index is, is greater than 30%, less than 50, um, and the hip abduction is less than 40, um, 40 Five. degrees, okay. then I, if the child has like some other contractures like in the ankle and they're going back with my physical medicine rehab colleagues, then I would recommend um, just phenol in the, in the obturators, um, not truly Botox. If they have a knee contracture, then maybe Botox in the medial hamstrings, um, but really nothing proximally. Thank you, Sean, for that. And uh, you also mentioned about iliopsoas recession. Do you do that often? And is there a difference between uh, doing a release at the pelvic brim versus at the insertion? Yeah. So I don't do that. And I think it's a component of my mentors. They didn't do that. Um, but from my colleagues that do do that, um, they they feel that if you're going to do an iliopsoas, then you should do a complete release at the at the brim and not the a recession. Thank you, Sean, for that. Just one last question before we wind up the session. Now you mentioned, I mean, you've shown pictures of a beautiful VDRO that you have done for uh, cerebral palsy hip, and do you do the uh, similar one for perthes as well? Is it? A, I mean, do you do? Do you see your perthes often, and do you do the similar procedure, or is there any difference? The only difference is I, 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 I really am careful to minimize the amount of varus I put for perthes. So, I think for CP, I've become. I do it so often that I, I, I kind of, I don't even measure, I just eyeball. Um, but for, for Perthes, I'm much more precise because I don't want to put those kids in any, you know, excessive barriers. So that's, that's the otherwise, but my instrumentation, everything else is the same. Thank you, Sean. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for the fantastic lecture. And I'm sure it's going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. All right, thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And sorry for my delay. Thank you so much for joining.